we are going with the men's class. We'll be uh, looking at a uh, beginning a new series today, um, going through this book, which is called Creating Biblical Leaders by God's Design by uh, Ken Wilson. And just to give you an idea of what is covered in this book, we'll just go through the table of contents so you can see what we're covering. So the first chapter, which is what we're going to be looking at today, is the biblical model of leadership. Then the subsequent chapters, biblical leadership in the home, qualifications of elders and deacons, the involvement ministries, the leadership of Nehemiah, the leadership of the Holy Spirit, improving communication skills, the secret of building a team spirit, the successful work environment, the basics of a planning process, developing potential leaders, leadership requires self-control, and then finally restoring the fallen sheep. So that's uh, the material that's going to be uh, covered in this book. And as we examine this topic of creating biblical leaders by uh, God's design and examining the biblical model of leadership, uh, we can think of um, how um, there are many sort of instructions or principles that we can gain from Scripture. And uh, as I've just mentioned, um, that's the uh, book there that we're um, referencing for this uh, class, and we'll be going through the introduction in chapter one of this book. So, by way of introduction, uh, Jesus was asked by the mother of the apostles James and John if one could sit on the right hand and the other on the left hand of the throne of Jesus when he came into his kingdom. And we could say that, basically, uh, a person being able to sit on the left and right hand of someone in a position of authority, uh, and indeed of someone such as Christ who is God, uh, that was a position very much of glory and of perhaps leadership in some sense, or some authority that these people may have had, uh, or may have thought they would have had. But consider what Christ said if we go to Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 28. It says, But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus here contrasts the rulers of the Gentiles, who were people that would basically uh, sort of lord it or glory in the authority that they may have had over those that were subject to them. Uh, but Jesus says that it would not be so among, um, among them, but basically, whoever desired to be great, they were to then become the other's servant and to be looking out for their needs and their interests. And indeed, Christ serves as the ultimate example of that. If, if anyone uh, deserved to be worshipped and to be ruler, and indeed he was, um, that was Christ. But yet Christ chose to still have this attitude of humility and of service, of course being submissive to uh, God the Father, and of course uh, being of service to us, because that's the whole reason he came to earth in the first place, to do us a service, to provide us a way that we can be reconciled back to God by giving himself as that sacrifice. And so Christ certainly serves as the ultimate example of leadership and of service. The church is the uh, body of Christ, and it is made up of many members. Um, as uh, we can think of, a human body is made up of many members of the hand, the foot, the eye, the ear. They're all very important, but they are all very different uh, components or members. But together, they all make up the body, and they work together so that the body can function effectively. Um, and so if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. It says... For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. And so, uh, an essential characteristic of um, those who aspire to be good leaders in the Lord's Church, um, this characteristic that they must develop and have is that of submission. Um, and some may desire the church to grow numerically, which is certainly, I suppose, good, um, <clears throat> but... Some, unfortunately, may compromise on the scriptural commands and uh, instruction to achieve this. They may um, compromise some things, some teachings that they might think make it easier or more accessible for people to come into the church, and thus they compromise scripture. And this is wrong, uh, because the scriptures must be followed, and this certainly is true for biblical leadership. Service leadership is biblical, and it is powerful in its function. Uh, God has always desired his leaders to be servants first. Um, and uh, if we consider Moses, who was a tremendous leader of God's people, uh, and we can think of how he was uh, one of the uh, great men of the Bible, of the Old Testament, he did many good things, and he was a very effective leader of uh, the Israelite nation overall. 
not to say he didn't have his flaws, but overall he is, uh, was a very good leader. Consider how God referred to him in uh, Malachi 4 verse 4. It says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in horror with all, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. And so Moses, he was a servant. Um, he was a servant of God, and we can also think of him. He didn't lord his authority over the others, but uh, he was uh, described as a man who was very meek. And so he was one that was not sort of glorying in his authority that he had over the people, but he was striving to look out for the people's best interests and lead them as best as he could. And we see even in the Old Testament, um, the value of a leader who was a servant was recognised by the people back in that time. Uh, I can go to First Kings chapter 12, verses 1 to 16. We won't read it for uh, the sake of time, but basically uh, there we've got uh, Rehoboam, um, who's uh, becoming king. And uh, you can, if you're familiar with the account, uh, there was basically um, the, uh, his father Solomon um, basically uh, had been perhaps uh, difficult in some ways, maybe. Uh, and so there was these two sort of groups of people. Uh, one was basically, if you will sort of be a servant to these people, if you will uh, try and ease their burdens and basically look out for the interests of these people, then they will be with you and be your servants forever. In fact, if we just look at verse 7, it says, And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today, and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. And so... Uh, these people, they had the um, idea that Solomon was harsh, but if uh, Rehoboam was a, solid, uh, was a servant to them, then they would basically look very favourably on that. But uh, he rejected that advice, um, and he followed the advice of the young men, and basically was even harsher on them, and of course they revolted as a result of that. And finally, uh, for our introduction, let's consider how Jesus contrasted himself uh, as the good shepherd uh, with a higher and we'll come back to this um, later on in the lesson. We go to John chapter 10, and we'll read verse 11. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And verses 12 and 13, But a hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Um, and verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. And so what we see from these verses is that uh, Jesus indeed is the good shepherd, and he is prepared to give his life to the sheep, and that's in fact what Jesus did. And so we see the care that uh, the shepherd, one who would basically be leading, one that would be in authority over the sheep, if you want to put it that way. Um, they care about uh, the sheep. Um, but a hireling, who is for someone that's basically a hired servant, to basically just mind the sheep, He's not that good shepherd. He doesn't have that same genuine care for his sheep or love for the sheep. And uh, if there's any danger coming, if there's a wolf coming, the hireling would flee, uh, whereas the good shepherd would stay and try and protect his sheep. And so, as we uh, move into uh, the main part of our lesson, and uh, we consider the important principle of the pattern principle. And when we consider uh, the word uh, pattern, if we go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. It says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And so we have Paul's command here to Timothy, which indeed holds true for us today, that uh, Timothy was to hold fast the pattern of sound words which he had heard from Paul, and we are to hold fast the pattern of sound words that we have in the Bible, in the New Testament. The word pattern in this verse um, when we think of the word pattern just in general, we may think of perhaps like how the bricks make up like a pattern and you can sort of, there's every second row, there's sort of a line in the middle of the other bricks and some sort of sequence of objects that form some sort of uh, pattern or sequence uh, that is uh, recognisable. But there is another sense of this word, which is what's being used here, which is a, a pattern, which means a standard form, figure, example, blueprint or design. So for example, we could think of a recipe uh, and that, in a sense, is a pattern. So if uh, there is a person that uh, creates this dish um, and then they write a recipe of how they created it, when we then take that recipe and we follow it, um, then we will get the same dish that the original uh, creator had uh, come up with. Uh, we can think of a pattern for clothing and how that, if that's followed, would produce the same item of clothing. We can think of a blueprint for a house or a design for something. If those uh, designs or patterns are followed, we will end up with the same um, result uh, that the creator or designer intended. So if these patterns are followed, they'll produce what the pattern was communicating. 
And so as we think of this uh, idea of a pattern, we have the pattern in Scripture for the New Testament church. God purpose, planned, and designed the church, the family, the plan of salvation, church leadership, and also individual Christian living. And God revealed what he wanted taught and practiced in his church through the apostles. If we go to uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. I'll just read this one. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And so we see here that uh, the apostles were certainly uh, being examples and uh, teaching uh, in the early days of the church. And so this is how God revealed um, what he wanted practiced in the early days of the church before we have the complete scriptures. The apostles uh, appealed for unity in accordance with the scriptures. They taught consistently what was to be believed and practiced. You didn't have Paul teaching something that was directly contrary um, to Peter or to uh, John when they were under inspiration, uh, of course. Uh, and so when we think of um, God's teachings, they were all uh, speaking things that were in harmony with one another, not contradicting, and they were wanting uh, people to be um, unified in the truth of uh, what God would have them to do. If we go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 to 12. Ephesians 1, 9 to 12 says, Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed... Um, in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So if we see here um, in verse 10, uh, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. And so, um, Paul was one that was teaching and wanting people to be unified. And, in fact, um, if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, sorry, and verse 10. It says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So again, we have this idea of unity. Uh, being stressed because there were some, uh, as you go in the context of the passage, uh, they simply they were attributing themselves towards Paul or towards uh, Paulus and those who baptized or taught them, uh, and this wasn't right because they were all baptized into Christ. The teachings that we have from God, as taught and demonstrated by the apostles, form the standard and pattern by which we know what the truth is and what we are to obey. If we go to Second Timothy chapter one and verse thirteen. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, which says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. So we looked at that earlier, but if we go to uh, chapter 2 and verse 2, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so again, we have the pattern that we are to hold fast to, uh, that we have in Scripture uh, now, that we have the completed word of God. And also, we have the command that we are to be able to teach these things to others so that they, in turn, can teach these things to others as well. And so, if we follow the pattern of the New Testament for the church, we will get the New Testament church, and by extension, we will also get the biblical pattern for its leadership. We must make sure that we follow this pattern as much as we can to the best of our ability when we are looking to develop leaders in the Church of Christ. Now, uh, one thing I did want to say because um, there was sort of looking at some of the things in the book. Um, just uh, It does talk about um, the uh, Holy Spirit uh, working, and it refers to it like working in through people. And so I just wanted to say um, a word of caution about this as we consider the biblical model of leadership and the importance of following the pattern for everything that we do in Christianity. There are three basic views of the Holy Spirit and how it works. Um, oh, and so the first one is the Holy Spirit directly dwells in us and leaves us separate and apart from God's word. And this view is uh, unscriptural and it takes away the completeness and authority of the scriptures. A fairly well known passage in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so the word of God is given by inspiration of God and it is, uh, contains everything that we need to know 
to make us complete, to be able to be a people that are following God as he would have us to. And so the idea of the Holy Spirit leading us in something additional to God's word means that the scriptures by implication are incomplete. And so this, of course, is unscriptural, it's contradictory to the scriptures, and it is a false view. The second view is that the Holy Spirit directly dwells in us, but does not lead or lead us or operate in us. And this is one view that our some brethren may have. And this view is not wrong in and of itself. But if we are not careful, this view can tend to lead to the view that we've just mentioned of where the Holy Spirit leads separate or some put it in conjunction with the word. And by implication, that means that the word basically needs some help. It's not complete. Uh, it's not sufficient for us, uh, which, of course, as we've said, is not scriptural. Given that the, that the idea of the direct leading of the Holy Spirit is very common in the denominational scene, it has even influenced some brethren within the Lord's Church. So we need to make sure that we are very careful that we are not also led astray. That leads us to the final view where the Holy Spirit only leads us through the Word of God. And this view is certainly a scriptural view. Um, the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired men to write what God wanted them to write so that we have the Bible, the completed Word of God. When we read the Bible, and we follow what the Bible says, the Holy Spirit in that sense can be said to be in us as we uh, think of and follow those teachings uh, revealed by the Holy Spirit in the Bible. If we go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. It says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but only men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit certainly uh, was the... Um, being that inspired uh, the human authors to write God's word. If we think of it this way as uh, an illustration, if there was a person that saw uh, that there was this tree that had been cut down, and they might ask you, well, um, how did this tree get cut down? You could say, well, uh, a man cut down the tree. And then you might have another person come along a bit later and ask, how was this tree cut down? And you would say, well, an axe cut down the tree. Um, but these two statements are contradictory. In actuality, uh, a man who was using the axe cut down the tree. And so, um, and so both of those statements are true. It's just to have a more complete picture it was both of them together. And so um, by comparison, uh, can the Holy Spirit be said to lead us today? Well, yes, he, yes, he can. But um, the scriptures, do they lead us today? Well, yes, they should. We should be reading it and following it. And so we can say that the Holy Spirit leads us through us reading and following his word, the word of God. And in that sense, the Holy Spirit and the Bible lead us today. So with all of that said, um, the Bible is certainly complete, uh, it contains everything that we need to know, and it is the ultimate pattern uh, that we need to follow in all things, including biblical leadership. And so that leads us to how uh, we have the need for biblical leaders to rise above their environment. Leaders can be classified in basically two ways, at least according to uh, this author. Uh, he talks about how uh, there can be reactionary leaders and visionary leaders. And visionary leaders are leaders who are not satisfied with the status quo. Um, they do not only deal with immediate problems, but they also actively uh, lead in new horizons of future planning, uh, hence the name visionary leaders. Uh, they are proactive as opposed to reactive. Uh, reactionary leaders, at least in uh, this author's view, um, do not lead at all. They basically just react, as the name implies, and they put out fires. So if there's a problem, they'll react and try and deal with that situation, get that sorted, and then there might be another problem that might come up, and then they'll deal with that one. Um, and it could be argued that they then show leadership in their reaction to that situation and how they manage it, but uh, that's not the uh, main point here. Um, reactionary leaders are always in a crisis mode, and crisis management is very important at a time of a crisis. Failure to problem solve in order to avoid or get through a crisis show a lack of true leadership. So uh, I would say that there is an element of leadership here in these uh, reactionary leaders. However, by contrast, uh, revisionary leaders are leaders who perceive problems before they occur, and they search for solutions in order to avoid problems. That may be able to sort of see the sort of, sort of situation and environment around it, and they might uh, think that oh, this could be a potential problem that may come up in the future, so they may take some steps to basically prepare to hopefully either millet, uh, mitigate the whole problem entirely, or to be prepared to effectively face the problem when the problem does arise. And we can even see some. Um, um, elements of this, um, some principles from this in scripture. We go to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. It says, A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. And so we have the principle here of that one who is prudent, one who is wise, he would be able to sort of perceive and foresee 
um, basically to think that this could be a potential issue and so he would foresee even and hide himself. He would take actions to get himself out of that situation. But the simple don't, uh, aren't looking for potential problems and potential situations that may arise and so they just pass on and they fall into whatever problem may arise. Uh, also in Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, If we go verses uh, 28 uh, to 32. It says, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him. Which one do you think? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. And so what we see here from these verses, when Jesus is talking about counting the cost uh, to follow him, he talks about how we need to be uh, people that are looking ahead and to be seeing potential um, problems, uh, if you will, or potential situations that may come up and um, to make the necessarily necessary arrangements. So he talks about how a person looking to build a tower, he had to basically count the cost of will I be able to afford to get this whole structure built and he would be looking ahead. Um, if he's not, then basically to wait until there's enough money rather than start and then find out, oh, I've run out of money halfway through. Or a man who is going to go to battle, to war, and uh, thinking, well, can I actually effectively win this battle? And if not, sends for conditions of peace. So again, he's looking ahead and uh, looking to um, <coughs> try and... Um, mitigate the problems or at least effectively uh, go through them. So biblical leaders, they need to be uh, people that are, are able to react to problems in a godly manner and in a wise manner. They need to be a people that are striving to look ahead, trying to perceive or foresee the needs and problems that may be incurred and secure the resources or take appropriate action to mitigate these problems. So as we consider um, the topic of leadership, there's certainly much secular um, thinking on the topic of leadership. And uh, we've got uh, a bit of a difference uh, between spiritual and secular leadership, or at least in some cases. Um, firstly, uh, in terms of biblical leadership, uh, we've seen how it's very important for biblical leaders to be people with a servant mindset. They must be servants. And this contrasts with what some may consider to be leadership in a secular sense, or at least certain leadership styles of one who's very, perhaps, um, like the Gentiles, they would lord it over the others and they would basically be barking down all these orders and commands and expecting all their subordinates to do it. And of course that is a certain type of leadership that I'm sure we're all familiar with or at least aware of. And the authoritarian approach leads to the formulation of institutionalism. And so this word, uh, institutional, uh, Webster defines as the characteristic of being instituted or to institutions rather than individuals. And so uh, some church leaders today might have the tendency to direct uh, the church towards being more of an institution. Uh, and so this can be seen by some of the more sudden decisions that uh, sort of push the church, um, shifting the emphasis from evangelism and from church growth, which are good things, to basically more presenting the church as an entertainment centre where we sort of come along to have a good time and perhaps be entertained with uh, some sort of uh, entertainment. And true worship, as the New Testament teaches, is not mainly about us. Sure, um, there is the encouragement and edification we get, and I'm um, sure God had that in mind when he had prescribed worship. Uh, but the main reason we worship is to fulfill God's command, to be pleasing to him. If we go to John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, it says, <laughs> But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. But the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so we see here that um, the Father is seeking such to worship him. We are worshipping God because that is what God has told us to do, uh, which is completely reasonable. And so that is our main uh, purpose for worshipping, uh, to fulfil God's command. Uh, and so as we think of institutions, um, they tend to be influenced by culture and they may adapt and change uh, what they do based on culture. However, the church, uh, by contrast, it is to be culturally sensitive, but it is not to be culturally driven. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 uh, to 23, we have the passage there where uh, Paul uh, talks about how he'd been made all things to all men, that he might by uh, all means to save some. And so he was aware of where people were at, and he would uh, sort of adapt his approach, but keep the same message. Um, 
and uh, strive to win as many as he could. Um, and so uh, that's what I mean by being culturally sensitive. But we are not to be culturally driven. We are not allowed. We are not to allow uh, the values of the world to uh, overtake what God's word teaches. So if the world <coughs> says something that may be uh, very popular, um, you can think of like the topic of homosexual marriage and things like that. That's very, or just homosexuality in general. That's a very uh, unfortunate, um, very sort of common or mainstream sort of thing. Like no one really has issues with it, sadly. Um, in uh, sort of the world sense. Uh, but it is certainly something that is unscriptural, and so we are to not allow culture to then allow us to go soft on our teaching on it, to even allow us to change our view. We are to hold fast to what the scriptures teach, regardless of what culture may say. Uh, in James chapter 4, verses 4 to 10, uh, or we'll just read verse uh, 4 and verse uh, 7. It says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Verse 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we have here the warning that if we are friends with the world, and if we are seeking to please the world and our culture, then that means that we are an enmity with God. Rather, we are told to submit to God, uh, and that is what is good and what is pleasing to him. The secular leader is one that is concerned about the work of reaching the maximum production for the institution to basically, what's the most that I can get out of this person to be the most effective to the company? Uh, or the institution, whereas the Christian leader is concerned about um, the individuals reaching the maximum potential that they can for the Lord, doing what they can, um, and using their talents in the service of the Lord. And so we can see some differences here. Biblical leadership is one that is to be an influence for good. Biblical leaders uh, motivate workers to be committed. They promote unity and effectively communicate with workers. The goal of biblical leaders needs to be to concentrate on effective communication that encourages and motivates the workers to understand the work that's assigned to them and to uh, be a people that are committed to accomplishing that goal. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. Ephesians 4 verse 29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart great to the, grace to the hearers. And so, um, leaders, um, biblical leaders who have that attitude of service are to be a people that are communicating and encouraging their workers to understand what it is that um, the work that is assigned and uh, to be a people that are going to actually get it done. There are three, um, well almost all problems that leaders face fall into three basic categories. Uh, one is poor communication, another one is a lack of commitment on the part of the people to work towards a clearly defined goal. And the last one is a lack of unity within and between team members and ministries. And so as we think of perhaps problems, perhaps it's in the workplace and we might have problems with uh, whether you're a leader or whether you're a person and you're under a leader and you can recognise problems, uh, chances are you could probably find at least one of these uh, factors as being one of the causes for uh, these problems. Either perhaps the leader's not communicating effectively, um, the people that are supposed to be doing the work are really committed towards getting the goal achieved or there's a lack of unity and there's perhaps, uh, some conflict between those uh, who are supposed to be doing the work. If there is poor communication, a lack of commitment or a lack of unity in a congregation, uh, not always, but it is most likely because there are these same deficiencies found in the leaders as well. Um, now that's not to say that that's always uh, the case because of course uh, everyone has their own choice to make of whether they're going to follow what God says, whether they're going to follow and do the best that they can uh, to help um, the work of the church and to be submissive to the leaders. So of course I get that there's all that individual uh, responsibility there. But if uh, you have by and large uh, leaders that are genuinely wanting the good uh, for the church and uh, people that are doing the work themselves, they are being servant leaders, then chances are, uh, if it's a widespread problem in the church, then there's perhaps some deficiency on the leader that they should address and work on. Biblical leaders strive for good communication, commitment, and unity. If you go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So we see here again, our biblical leaders are our people that are striving for unity in accordance with what the scriptures said. So if um, they can make peace without compromising on scripture, then they should do their best to do so. In Titus chapter 1 verse 9, it says, Holding fast to the faithful word as has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, 
both with Zort and Convict, those who contradict. And so by this verse, it necessarily implies that they are people that are committed to um, holding fast the faithful word, to follow what God has said in the Bible, and to communicate effectively, to uh, convict uh, those who are out of line to, uh, towards those who are in error, and to basically exhort people. And as we consider um, the fact, uh, no one can be neutral, and uh, we can see this from basically experience and also from scripture, where in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus talked about no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, to love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in that. So basically we have the principle here that you have to pick one. You're either going to be following God or you're going to be against God. You can't sort of be on that neutral ground. So as we consider that a leader is basically the power, um, or leadership is basically the power or ability of one person to influence another. And as they can't be vi uh, neutral, it is vital and it is important that biblical leaders are a people that are influences the good upon uh, their fellow Christians and upon others. If they follow the Bible's teaching, then they will be influences for good. So as uh, we've talked about already, biblical leaders are servants. Submission requires us to be willing to serve others and meet their needs above and beyond our own. Paul tells us that we should have the mind of Christ, which is the ultimate example of submission. And we can see that in Philippians 2, verses 3 to 11, of how Christ being the Son of God, uh, being um, the creator of the universe, um, Christ, he took it upon himself to come in the form of a man, to humble himself um, by being in human form and submitting himself to the will of the Father, keeping the Father's law perfectly. And he had that attitude of submission and of service uh, while he was here in this earth. And so we too, certainly, as God's creation, as Christians, as members of God's family, should be a people that also are submissive uh, to God and uh, should be, have this attitude of service towards our fellow Christians and towards our fellow men to be looking out for the interests of others. Submission is, a pow uh, is powerful in that those who possess it have the ability to persuade and to lead others. Um, it is evident that we do not uh, necessarily need leaders, at least um, not many leaders anyway, uh, in the church who do nothing but call the shots. We need leaders who, by their service and shepherding, stimulate and encourage the church to develop the heart and mind of a servant. And so uh, that's uh, very important because if there's a person that sort of just um, basically you might think just they seem to have this list of commands and they're telling all these people you need to do this, this, this and uh, they're really rousing on you to get it done by this deadline or this time or why haven't you done this? Uh, it can be very easy for us to have a negative impression of that leader. Whereas one that is, you know, one that is uh, having this submissive and service attitude would be uh, in there working with you to be doing that. Because after all, we are all Christians uh, seeking to serve God as best as we can, including the leaders and those who are being led. And so it's not like our leaders are better uh, than those who uh, they are leading, but simply they are just uh, different roles. Biblical leaders are to inspire others. Serving requires a relational style of leadership rather than a positional style. Um, a positional style emphasizes the authority that a person has over another based on their position. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verses 1 to 3, uh, it says, the elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And so we have here um, Peter exhorting uh, his fellow elders to shepherd the flock of God and to uh, not be as lords over them, not to sort of be all high and mighty over those uh, that they were um, leading, but they were to simply have this attitude of service to be examples to the flock and to be involved with the work themselves and to be uh, modelling and being an example to others. The relational style of leadership is carried out through serving those um, who are being led. And so uh, that leads us to uh, what we referred to before in our introduction of how biblical leaders are good shepherds and good shepherds care about their sheep. Christ, of course, being the ultimate good shepherd, caring about um, um, his sheep and giving his life on the cross uh, for his sheep so that we uh, can be saved. And so we, uh, or those who are striving, those who are seeking to be good leaders, I should say, 
Those who are seeking to be biblical leaders need to care about those that they are ruling over, those that are they are leading, and to be genuinely looking out for their interests. And if they do that, then that will be something very good uh, for both the leader and those who are being ill, uh, create a good uh, relationship there. And then the final point is that biblical leaders are created. Um, no one uh, in the church today is uh, being born as a good biblical leader. It is something that uh, people uh, can learn and are uh, created. Uh, it takes time to uh, develop. Um, we can consider the example of Moses. We won't read the passage now, but in Exodus 3.10 to 4 verse 17, we can see how uh, basically he uh, was told by God that he's going to basically be a leader for the people. And um, we can see that he basically comes up with all these reasons or excuses of basically, well, oh, I'm not eloquent, uh, or it's like, what shall I say? And basically he's finally like, just try and just send something. Like, if you can find someone else, send them. And God ends up getting understandably angry with Moses. Uh, and we consider from these very humble and uh, beginnings of Moses, he went on to become one of the greatest leaders um, of um, well, I think even uh, recognised in the world, he's uh, become um, recognised as a leader that was very effective. You can also consider the example of Gideon, of how uh, he was one that um, basically he didn't have a very high and mighty opinion of himself. He wasn't what we might say was a leader from the get-go, but he was basically like my tribe of Manasseh, like it's the least of these things. And he was wanting evidence from God. He's wanting like, well, if you really want me to be a leader, like give me a sign. And God gave him those signs, and he then, to his credit, went on and became a very effective leader for God's people. So in conclusion, uh, we've considered how we have the pattern of Scripture and how it is very important for us to follow the pattern. And if we follow that pattern, we will end up with uh, what um, the pattern was trying to communicate. So as we follow the pattern of the Bible, of the New Testament, for the church and for uh, biblical leadership, we will end up with biblical leadership and all those things that the Bible teaches. We've seen how biblical leaders need to rise above their environment, they need to be looking ahead to try and uh, foresee potential issues and take appropriate steps to um, respond to them. We've considered how spiritual and secular leadership are not always the same thing, of how uh, secular leadership may sometimes have uh, leaders that are basically just very authoritarian, speaking all these commands to their subordinates and expecting them to get done and sort of... Um, not really involved with sort of the lower ranks, whereas spiritual leadership is very much uh, has an emphasis on service and humility. We've seen how it's important for biblical leadership to influence the good, um, how biblical leaders are servants, and as a result, they are to be people that inspire others and encourage them. We've considered how biblical leaders are good shepherds, uh, to be genuinely caring about those that they are leading, and we've seen how biblical leaders are created. So um, if we do want to strive to be a leader um, in the church or to be just a, a leader in a biblical sense, whether it's uh, in your home or something like that. If we follow the principles of the scripture, you can uh, be a good biblical leader and something that you can uh, be created uh, to be in a sense, if you want to put it that way. So let's all strive to be following God as best we can, developing a submissive attitude towards God and looking out for the needs of others so that we can be biblical leaders ourselves also that we can encourage those who are biblical leaders perhaps in the church. Um, I know we're about up to time, but uh, yeah, are there any quick comments that anyone has in the last couple of years? Yes. No, you were mentioning Moses as a good leader. He is a good example. Yes. I read something, I don't know if any of the other saw it. It said, the first 40 years of Moses' life, he thought he was a somebody. The second 40 years of his life, he, re he realized he was a nobody. The last 40 years of his life, he realized God can use nobodies. So that's a good idea of how the attitude you need to have uh, to be a reason for God to use it. Like all theories, easy to learn, hard to practice. But as having been a leader in the world and having been a manager myself, it's very easy to fall in the trap of power and wanting more power and being more authoritative and even in the home. So striving to be a biblical leader requires a lot of effort and a lot of constant reminder. Uh, whereas being a secular leader is actually much, much easier. It's like falling into a trap, you, you know, it's very much easier. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, let's uh, close in a word of prayer.
Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, for this week. We thank you that we can have this time to uh, learn from your word about um, biblical leadership and the biblical model of leadership. And we thank you for, um, we thank you for uh, your word that you have given to us that we can read, that we can follow, and that we can know everything that we need to know to make sure that we are living our lives as you would have us to. And we thank you for the example of your son, Jesus Christ, of how he, being God, uh, the son, came to earth and uh, was uh, submissive to you and uh, gave himself as a sacrifice on the cross and was the ultimate form of humility and submission. And we thank you for the examples we have in scripture of those who have been leaders. We pray that we may, um, or those of us who um, are striving to be leaders, will uh, be biblical uh, leaders, whether it be uh, in the congregation here or whether it be in uh, the home or whatever situation. We pray that we may be uh, biblical and godly leaders and um, we pray that uh, we will encourage and support those uh, who are in uh, positions of leadership and are uh, all um, striving to follow you as best as we can and to basically be looking for the uh, good of the uh, church as a whole. We uh, pray that you will look after us now and we pray these things to you in Jesus' name. Um, amen. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.